Welcome back to CivilNet. I'm your host, Patrick Elliott, and I'm uh, delighted to be joined today by Don Lambert, the country director of the Asian Development Bank. Don, good to have you on. Thank you. Um, tell us, um, you are going to be overseeing the implementation of the bank's new country partnership strategy. Can you walk us through the vision for Armenia? So when we put together these country partnership strategies, we have a five-year time frame. And typically we focus on several pillars around which we organize our work. And so for Armenia, what we are proposing to our board, which will consider the proposal early next year, are three pillars. The first on private sector development, the second on development of the capacity of human, uh, human capacity and governance, and the third on climate change. So if I may, I'll, I'll go back to each of these. And, and if you want to discuss one more in detail, please feel free to intervene. Uh, Armenia is an upper middle income country recently acknowledged as on a per capita basis as, as the wealthiest in the, the Caucasus. For an upper middle income country, private sector development is absolutely critical because this is really where you have the opportunity for the private sector to drive growth, to drive tax revenues, to drive employment, and really bring about that broad-based development. Um, we will be focusing on private sector development primarily through our investments into private sector companies um, about a billion dollars or more a year, ADB invests into the private sector. Uh, here in Armenia, cumulatively, we've only invested about 400 million. So I, I think there is greater potential for us to, to work. And when we invest in the private sector, we have certain sectors that we have found have the, the greatest development impact. So financial institutions, infrastructure, health, education, agriculture. So that, that's going to be the focus. So that's the first pillar on private sector development. Now, the second pillar on human and governance capacity development. Armenia, landlocked country, closed borders. Not, you know, there's some, some mining, but not a huge amount of natural resources. It is not going to become an upper income country by digging things out of the ground or by manufacturing. It will have to come through a knowledge economy. And here, the keys are, do you have the human capacity to develop and deliver on that knowledge economy? And do you have the governance systems and policies and, and legal structure in place to organize that activity? Uh, and so that's going to be the second focused. And, and I think that's, that's really unique given Armenia's landlocked developing country status. And then the third point would be climate change. ADB is Asia's climate change bank. It is a focus of, of essentially everything we do at this point. Climate change is coming uh, and temperatures are rising. They're not rising equally. So some countries, including Armenia, are experiencing higher temperature changes than others. And if you combine that with a mountainous, arid, high elevation, that's going to introduce real challenges to water management. And in Armenia, I think our climate change work is primarily going to be focused around this adaptation. How do you adapt the economy, and particularly the agricultural sector and the water management, to deal with rising temperatures and, and falling precipitation? So that would be the third pillar. We have a lot to unpack here. Okay. Well, well let, let's start with the, um, I wanted to talk, actually, we'll, let's start with the climate. Um, what are some of the key, um, the key changes that the government needs to make from a legislation standpoint? So the government, I, I, I give a lot of credit to looking at this adaptation issue. Um, often when we're in discussions with government, adaptation is, is a very difficult sell. One, because developing countries say, well, we didn't create the problem. Why should we be investing in an adaptation to deal with its consequences? And two, because adaptation, it's like buying insurance. Do you like paying your insurance bill? No. No, no one does, right? It's preventative rather than a cure. Exactly. Uh, and so I, I think really to its credit, when we talk to government officials, they are actually very sensitive to the need of adaptation. Um, and that is critical. 
and and the most pressing area will be in water management and, and reservoir construction and and getting the most out of every drop of water that the agriculture and other sectors use. I do know that they have uh, they have passed some. Uh some laws to manage, uh, you know, to, to, to kind of restructure the way that farming is done, uh, irrigation, and they're kind of pushing for that lately. But, you know, there's a lot of uh, feedback that it's, it's, not, it's not enough. Uh, they, they haven't done enough so far. Is that something that you've noticed as well? What I would focus is on what needs to be done. And, and here, I think, if we look at some of the major initiatives underway, um, you know, CAPS Reservoir is, is a large project that's being developed. Uh, with support from KFW, that's an important project. Um, there's several other reservoirs, uh, I believe 18 or so, that the government has identified as requiring investment. And so really, you know, ADB's focus is on how can we support the government to provide the reservoirs and improving the irrigation to meet the needs that are out there. You guys didn't do any investment in solar, for example, any kind of renewable energy? We are right now about to launch a site-specific wind study. Armenia has about 2.5 gigawatts of renewable energy potential. Um, two gigawatts in solar and 500 mil, uh, megawatts in wind. The solar is, is starting to move and up and running. The wind is, has been less identified and we have, as I said, that wind study that's gonna start next year that's gonna look at collecting some site-specific data to analyze whether or not there's potential for some specific wind generation assets. And to a peasant like myself, 2.5 megawatts, is that a lot? Is that, is that serious? Is there serious game-changing potential for renewables in Armenia? I, I think it is a lot. And, and it's a lot in a couple ways, right? One, as Armenia gets wealthier, it's not gonna be through heavy industry. It's gonna be through an, a knowledge economy. And so you tend to have less intensive use of electricity as GDP is growing. So very different from another country that might be growing through manufacturing, right? where they always need more and more and more electricity. Uh, the second perspective on it is for Armenia, renewables is not only about climate change. It's also about energy security, right? Because no border clo closure or trade agreement is going to stop the wind from blowing or the sun from shining. And so for Armenia, the more it can increase energy independence, the more it can conserve its uh, hard currency uh, for other purchases besides gas, uh, the better the country is going to be. So it's a win-win both for the climate and for the country. Yeah. As of this year, uh, something like 9% of... Uh... Armenia's energy comes from renewables. Uh, so there's already some headway that's being done. It's just interesting to see the extent to which um, they can expand it and, and, and really utilize this resource. I mean, we have something like 300-ish 300, 300 uh, sunny days a year, right? So we're, we're, we're pretty prime suited for this. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit. I want to talk a little bit more about Armenia's economic potential. Uh, yes, we've become a, a, an upper middle income country, which is a, a tremendous feat. But what are some of the growth avenues you see for Armenia specifically? Um, how can it overcome its, its uh, let's say, geopolitical situation, its, its regional isolation to create genuine wealth, to, to, to create value-added industries that, would, that can compete on a global level? Yeah. So we work primarily with the government. And when we work with the government, it's about creating a playing field that allows the private sector to come in and develop. Right. And so I would focus on three areas, education, health, and efficiency of government delivery. So let's talk about each of those. So first of all, with education, I'm really proud of work we've been doing to build new schools here in the country. Uh, we recently approved a new project that is going to provide um, further funding to develop 46 schools. And this is part of a larger government program to develop 431 schools. Uh, this work is absolutely critical because if you don't have the physical infrastructure, it doesn't matter what your, your school systems are or how good your teachers are, uh, kids can't concentrate if water is dripping from the roof. Yeah. And, and we've seen some of the older schools, which, which have been in bad shape, and you can bear them to the newer schools that have been built in the program, and it's really a game changer for these kids. 
The other area that I think is important within education is on technical and vocational training. Okay. Armenia has unemployment, low double digits, 12, 13%. So 11% of this right. year. Um, and at the same time, when I talk to private sector, I hear that they're having a hard time filling jobs. Yeah. Right? And this, in the long term, sure, we, we need to bring kids into good schools and we need to revise our education systems. But what about the current generation? And this is where technical and vocational training is really critical so that you have people who are unemployed or underemployed reskilling them so that they can meet the needs that the private sector has now. Uh, that would be my other second priority on education. Now, you can have a really well-educated workforce, but if they're sick, they're not going to deliver. And credit to Armenia to moving forward with universal health care coverage, very important reform. But if you make health care cheaper, any economics 101 is going to teach you that the demand is going to go up. And so you've got to have the supply in place to deal with that increased demand. And so we are working with the government on a, a new health care program on quality of hair, care to help increase the supply of primary care facilities that are available so that when the universal health care coverage comes in place, you've got the facilities to meet that demand. Moving on from health, just one touch on governance. Um, a lot of good things we see the government doing particularly in the area of physical management. Uh, we've been working with the government on capital markets development, on public investment management reform, on public financial management, so managing the debt and, and to the government's credit, that has done very well. Uh, that's, a, that's a place where all countries have, have room to grow and strengthen, and so that will be a continued area of support for us. But then also digitization. There are a lot of government services that could be improved through more intensive use of technology, taking advantage of what is out there and, and bringing it here. And particularly because there is already such a, a strong local IT industry, it makes sense that if the private sector can do it here in our media, then the government should be following that lead. So that would be our other emphasis in terms around government strengthening. I want to circle back to the health, uh, the healthcare uh, issue because, well, specifically, what I'd like to know is: Are you guys investing in the infrastructure itself, or are you also educating the the populace? Are you investing in programs to educate uh, on, let's say, just just general uh, health knowledge? Uh, I'll give you a very specific example. Armenia has one of the highest uh, cancer rates uh, for men. The vast majority of men smoke cigarettes. Uh, the recent statistics from just a couple of months ago is that now we have a, ch a childhood obesity rate of 30%. So there's very little understanding of proper nutrition, of health habits in general. Uh, so I'm, I, you know, coming from a, a country with socialized healthcare where I had to wait nine months to see a doctor, whereas here I can book an appointment and within an hour I can see a doctor. To me, I'm, I'm not happy about this. Um, but that's, I'm not saying that Armenians shouldn't have access to healthcare. That's not what I'm talking about. What I mean is that I think that there needs to be the necessary education first. And I, I heard that that is part of the program now is that they have to comply to, I think it's a, a regular screening, uh, health checkups before they're able to go and access uh, you know, their, their healthcare, which makes some sense to me. But I'm wondering if it's part of what you guys are involved in is also helping the population, helping the government better educate the population on, uh, on health itself. So the... The scope of the, the, the project are still being discussed. Um, I do expect that there will be a component that focuses on policy and quality of income, or quality of outcomes in terms of health outcomes. Uh, but there will also be the physical infrastructure. And, and to your point, uh, one can't go without the other. I, I recently was visiting some healthcare facilities and, and we went to one that was uh, probably 60 or 70 years old that served a community of 3,500 people. When I asked the doctor, how many people do you see a day? They said, eh, six or seven. Then we went to another community, so smaller, 2,500 people, and asked the doctor, how many do you see per day? And they said, oh, about 20. So what's the difference between the two? 
Well, the second community had a healthcare facility that was revised 20 years ago. And so it gives patients the comfort that if I'm sick, I'm gonna proactively reach out to the doctor. Whereas in the other situation, people only went to that if they were really sick. Now let's come back to your point about preventative medicine. How does that education happen? It happens when doctors and nurses talk to patients. Sure, there's larger, broader programs, but if patients don't have the confidence to walk into a primary care facility, that's a lost opportunity on education. Yeah, that makes sense. I just, my worry is that for developing countries, I mean, even for developed countries, just healthcare costs are, are astronomical. Like it's a very heavy burden for the state. So how would Armenia be, be able to balance, um, you know, a reasonable tax burden, let's say tax incentives to bring foreign investment and workers here to stay here and to live here and at the same time providing quality care that, that tends to be expensive for the state? It is, and I, and I think coming back to working with the government on governance initiatives, this is really critical, right? How does the government plan and manage their budget? So right now, tax revenues are about 24%. That's not bad for an upper middle income country, but it, there's certainly scope to bring that higher. And that provides the basis to fund the healthcare, right? And then your point about healthcare being expensive, it is indeed, but we've also seen that if governments invest wisely, right, better efficiency, use of systems, and, and especially digitization, yep. there are opportunities to drive that cost curve down. Finally, Don, uh, I wanted to ask you, just in your own personal capacity, if you had three top reforms that you would push through that would make the biggest impact as soon as possible, right? Three game changers. Yeah. What would those be? So. Um, number one would be on connectivity. Okay? We haven't talked about that yet. The North-South Expressway is a, is a very ambitious project that the government has undertaken. It's a very important project. And I think investments that ADB has made to date have been very important, and it's an area where we'd like to continue to invest. Um, you know, having traveled across the country since I've been here, uh, if you go up to Goomri, there's huge trucks barreling down through the middle of the city. Yeah. Now, how do you develop a tourist infrastructure? How do you develop a knowledge economy when you've got semi-trucks rolling outside your door? And so a bypass around there is absolutely critical. Um, going down south, down to the Sunik region, um, discussions going on about a, a completing the, this, the, uh, the, the uh, Sisan Kajaran section of the North-South Expressway. Um, absolutely critical. Those are communities that have goods that they could be expect, exporting to Yerevan, people who need to get health care up in Yerevan, and it, it takes them a day or two to get up there, yeah. right? Uh, so that would be my first one. Second, uh, very encouraged by the government's announcement at an ADB-sponsored event in Georgia about the crossroads of peace. Um, this is a potential game changer because if you go back and look at the history, for example, of Europe, how did France and Germany eventually achieve peace? It was through economic trade. integration and trade, right? And that trade is facilitated through transport. And so ADB, I think, can play a big role in that. Uh, one, through the, the transit links we talked about. We talked about the roads already. I'd also say rail. Rail is a big part of that a lot of renovation that needs to be done to bring those rail links back into use. But other, otherwise, ADB is a convener. So we, we sponsor something called the Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation Program. It stretches from Mongolia in the east to across the former Soviet states down here into the South Caucasus. Uh, if you look across that expanse, there's one noticeable exception of a country not a member, and that's Armenia. And so I think facilitating dialogue among neighbors and then bringing investment and technical assistance into that dialogue really could help cement the Crossroads of Peace initiative. And then the, the third point I would bring up is coming back to this issue of climate change. Um, these adaptation investments are absolutely critical. Uh, agriculture is and will continue to be not only a large part of GDP, but it's a part of GDP that 
helps address regional disparities, economic inequality. And so agriculture is going to remain really important. But for that to happen and to be viable, you need to ensure that the irrigation is well secured. And so I think that would be a, another priority for ADB is, is to make those adaptation investments. Fantastic. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, to host you, Don. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing the, the results of your work here in Armenia. I enjoyed it, Patrick, and I'd like to wish you and your viewers a very Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thanks again for watching. It's been Pat from Civilnet, and we'll catch you all very soon.